our, our prayer stole a little bit of my thunder this morning, so <laughs> that's quite all right. But what we're going to be uh, hearing about today is, is what I think of as, as one of my favorite, almost oldest professions in the world. <laughs> almost. And this is something that dates back long, long ago, 500,000 or 5,000 B.C., by some accounts. It was found on papyrus. I'm certain it was created long before that, and as I understand it, a lot of it was just as a result of some mistakes. Somebody screwed something up, and somebody tried it, and they go, Woo! I like this! But what you're going to hear about today is a wonderful organization in our community that the product that they make is not as a result of any mistakes. It's out of hard work, a solid education, and a solid fundamental of those wonderful hops and barley and things that Chuck spoke of. So today our guest speaker is Jared Barnes. He's the owner and head brewer of Collusion Tapworks, and he was born and raised right here in York, Pennsylvania. After attending the Siebel Institute Master Brewers course and finishing his education at Domans Academy in Munich, Germany for brewing technology, Jared began his brewing career back here in the States at Southern Tier Brewing Company, located in New York. He has since led brewing operations at Darwin Brewing Company in Florida, Mispillion River Brewing in Delaware, and briefly as the head brewmaster of Windridge Farms until May of 2015. His beers have won awards at both World Cup, excuse me, the World Beer Cup, as well as the Great American Beer Festival as well as Best Florida Champions and the Delaware State Championship. If you haven't tried his selections yet, I strongly encourage you to do so. They're some of my favorites. The topics that he's going to discuss with us today will be the Collusion Tapworks and a brief history of how it was founded, as well as his future goals, expansions, community engagement, his involvement with the YCEA, Downtown Inc., and other organizations in York. So, ladies and gentlemen, a nice round of applause for our guest speaker, Jared Barnes. Well, thank you for having me today. Uh, I do apologize about the attire. I know I'm severely underdressed compared to the rest of you. Uh, however, I did just come from work and unfortunately have to go back. Uh, right after this discussion. Um, but that being said, thank you for having me here th uh, this afternoon. Um, as Lem was saying, uh, I did grow up here in York, Pennsylvania, a uh, graduate from York Suburban High School in 2003, uh, and then from there joined the Navy, traveled around the world, uh, came back and started going to school at uh, Penn State for structural engineering. And while I was doing that was working at a bar, bartending, and started home brewing. And from there, it progressed within six months to having tens of thousands of dollars of just random assorted brewing equipment in my garage to the point where I was spending all my time doing that and not really going to school. Um, my father, Chuck Barnes, who some of you might know, he actually owns a uh, um, uh, construction management and tenant coordination company here in York, uh, decided to say to me, you should probably go to school for beer as opposed to wasting my money on your education that you obviously don't want to use. So that's what I did. I ended up uh, starting in Chicago, going to Siebel Institute there in Chicago, um, and then moving to Germany and finishing up my education at Domes Academy uh, for brewing technology and biochemistry. And from there, it was kind of the sky's the limit. Um, I had the opportunity to go and work for a great brewery, uh, Southern Tier up in New York. Uh, they offered me the job right out of school, which was pretty amazing from my perspective considering the fact of how big Southern Tier is and the quality of product that they put out. Uh, worked there for about six, seven months, had the opportunity to move down to Florida and um, start a company with uh, two other gentlemen who, one of which was in real estate, the other one of which was an executive chef, James Beard Award winner, and then myself who made beer. And they brought me down there to open up Darwin Brewing Company down in Sarasota. And that was wonderful, Florida was great. Um, really great. I'm not sure why I left for <laughs> cold weather and miserable rain, but that being said, um, worked there for about a year and a half, left there, got another opportunity to, uh, to help some other folks open a brewery in Delaware, and that's where Mispillion River started. Uh, from Mispillion River, I got to really experiment with a lot of different old school techniques as well as new techniques for brewing, for 
um, for aging, for blending, for souring, and that's really where I got to shine is when it comes to experimentation and the different beer styles that we do at Collusion. Um, but there was always that longing to kind of come back to York. Family was here, friends were still here. So when the opportunity at Windridge came about, I jumped on that really quick. Gorgeous location, great brew house, um, you know, good, good people. And once I moved back here to York and started, you know, working at Windridge, I thought to myself, well, there's really no reason why I can't do this myself. And um, went to my dad and to my uncle and said, hey, I, I'm kind of to the point where I want to open up my own place. You know, you get that entrepreneurial spirit and just want to inject yourself into the community and start up a business that you can wash, grow, and prosper that was yours from the ground up, and that's really what I wanted to do. Um, so we started looking at different places uh, for the brewery. We went over into Columbia area, over across the Susquehanna, which I know most people probably haven't done. You know, that whole different divide is kind of <laughs> sketchy for some people. Uh, went to Columbia, went to Marietta, uh, looked in Lancaster, over in Wrightsville, and saw a couple of places. Um, but once we finally got back into downtown York, uh, saw the location for Collusion where the Bond building is there on the corner of King and Queen Street and they had this little 4,600 square foot warehouse behind it that was six overhead lights, uh, lead based paint covering the walls and a concrete floor that had so many cracks in it you couldn't walk without tripping over something. Uh, but it had potential, you know, like, like a lot of the buildings here in downtown York, um, it had quite a bit of potential and we decided to take Collusion and divide that 4,600 square feet up into half brewery, half tasting room. So we um, decided to go that route and uh, within just shy of just shy of 13 months of planning, uh, we decided to open the doors of Collusion Tapworks in September of 2016. So we are now 18, 19, almost 20 months into it and are we celebrating our two year anniversary coming up here um, September 2nd of this year. So. As we were going through this whole process, there's a lot of learning curves. Um, even with having opened up other breweries, you know, and helping people open up other breweries, there's still a lot of learning curves when it comes to what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do, naming, trademarking. Uh, the legalities of it is just mind-boggling, which I'm sure he can attest to. Uh, and the name collusion actually arose from just happen, happening to walk into my father's house and seeing that single word written on a piece of paper on his countertop. We had actually run through seven or eight <coughs> different names uh, between uh, and different iterations of, of different names through trademark and everyone came back, which took almost a month for every everyone to go through. Everyone came back as used or invalid or you know uh, already taken and it just got to the point where I said, you know what, collusion sounds like a cool word, let's use it. And that's literally how the entire name Collusion Cap Tapworks came up. Um, now, you know, Donald Trump has definitely helped us out <laughs> after the fact. We had Collusion first, so that's, that's, where, that's where I'm sticking with that. Uh, but the, the basis of Collusion was being able to bring something to York that, you know, other, that other breweries haven't done so far. You know, I'm, I'm very good friends with all the guys down there at Crystal Ball, at Liquid Hero, with Gift Tours, with Mexitali, with Wimbridge. Um, but York County was lacking in a wide variety of styles and things that I had been able to do that I was, you know, lucky enough to do at the other breweries with sour beers and blending and old school techniques and barrel aging. And Collusion was kind of an idea to bring all of those beer styles together under one roof so people could experience old school beer styles, you know, we, we go back to ancient Scottish gruets, which just use herbs and spices to better the beer and flavor the beer as opposed to hops. Uh, we do new school New England style IPAs and sour beers with lactose sugars and boatloads of fruit to them. Uh, we're actually getting ready to release a couple bourbon barrel aged and rum barrel aged beers next week. Uh, we do everything from French style beers, Belgian style beers to uh, we just tapped a, an old Australian style lager called an Australian sparkling beer. Uh, this week, so we kind of really just have a wide variety of stuff that everybody can experience something new every single time that you come into the brewery, and it gives you kind of a better understanding of where beer has been and where beer is going, and that's that's kind of the idea, and well, yeah, the, that's the idea for Collusion, was to basically just give everybody a uh, general understanding of all the different beer styles 
um, past, present, and future. Um, we do a lot of stuff with the community too. I mean, we are we're uh, involved with the Brews and Views uh, with YCEA. They come and I believe four times, three or four times a year, we sit down and we do basically an impromptu discussion about just whatever any any topics that anybody would like to speak on. It's not a political setting. It's a very relaxed, laid back type of atmosphere where you can just hang out, drink a beer, and have a discussion without feeling overwhelmed or compromised by having other people over talking you know or, or over speaking or overshadowing you and it's just kind of a general easy setting um, first friday latino we're involved with we donate beer every single month for first friday latino uh, in fact this week or i'm sorry this month uh, coming up here in june that is going to be held actually in rural square district where collusion is, collusion is located and lou rivera is going to be speaking on that and we'll be doing beer donations for that and bringing people from the community into the area to show them what collusion has to offer and what the Royal Square District has to offer in general between the Parliament's Arts Organizations and uh, the Tattoo Parlor, the Costa Cigar Shop, the Bond Building, and everything in that vicinity. Uh, we work with Salvation Army quite a bit. We actually have an event coming up here called Christmas in July where we do a Toys for Tots drive in the summertime as well as in the winter time to kind of generate more uh, more gifts for the children during the winter time in the off season. Uh, on top of that, we worked with the uh, with the firefighters to do a quite a big raffle and uh, event for us um, for the firefighters fund for the two that passed uh, the other month, and we raised over seventy five hundred dollars for that event uh, in a single day, which was great. Um, and then we have a couple things upcoming for collusion. Uh, we are currently in the process of purchasing a canning line. Uh, we're getting canning line delivered here. We're actually going to be doing an expansion and doubling our capacity, adding more fermenters uh, to what we currently have, uh, working on new glycol system upgrades and purchasing a building across the street from where collusion is to allow for cold storage uh, to expand our distribution footprint outside of just the three counties or four counties that we distribute to now. We're going to try to get down into Maryland if we can. The TTB is difficult to work with, the Tax and Trade Bureau on, a, on the legal end, but we think we can get through it. And uh, potentially a second location over in Lancaster County. Uh, that's, that's the next step for us. And working with current beer trends um, where, you know, tasting rooms and, and brew pubs are king. The distribution game just isn't what it used to be, and people want to drink local, people want to drink good, and people want to drink at a place they can walk down the street and hang out at. So that's, that's where collusion is kind of moving to. But uh, that's that's really all I have. Uh, does anybody have any questions about anything? Yes, sir. What is the logo depicting? Okay, so, well, I'll have to step over here. Uh, the Collusion logo was actually created by a friend of my father's. It is, the original company was called B3 Brewing Company. Uh, myself, my uncle, and my father, Chuck Barnes, Doug Barnes, Jared Barnes, B3 Brewing Company. So we have the three faces of the company. And the letters in sign language are the letter B and the number three for B3 Brewing Company, which is the holding company that Collusion Tapworks is under. And we wanted to go with more of a kind of old school, underground collusion deal. So we incorporated some of the old Freemasonry items into the design with the pyramid. Only instead of a pyramid, we used the hops and the sunlight coming out. And that's that's where the that's where the whole logo came from. Yeah. Yes. Um, I've, I'm always impressed when I come in and that, to your point earlier about how many different styles that you're rolling out. There's always something new and always something different. So my question is about your recipe development and testing process. It's sort of how how you go through that. Do you test? Do you throw it in and roll it out and see how people respond. So thankfully enough, because I've been doing this for about seven years now, um, a lot of these recipes, well not a lot, I'd say probably half the recipes were based off of stuff that I've done at other breweries. Um, but once you do, once you use so many ingredients, so many different ways, you kind of have an understanding of what the beer is going to taste like before it's even brewed. Now luckily, we have actually two brew systems. We've got our big seven barrel system, which creates enough beer, 220 gallons at a ton, about 
uh, for distribution, which gives us about 40 sixths worth of beer. But we also have a one barrel pilot system where we can do 30 gallons at a time to do experimentations before we ramp it up to the big system. Now, that in theory is how it's supposed to work. Typically, we just kind of go in and make whatever we want on either system, and whatever happens, happens. Uh, but that being said, we have, as of today, we have done 341 different beers now since we've been open for 19 months. Uh, we release around two to three new beers every single week. And the creative process for me is actually, I, I derive a lot of my stuff from the culinary background and food. I love cooking, I always have. In fact, I almost blew a whole bunch of my father's money on going to Johnson & Wales for culinary arts instead of wasting it on structural engineering. Uh, sorry to all the engineers out there, I apologize, or the culinary arts students. Uh, but a lot of it is derived from, from the food background, and I'll go into different restaurants and try different items. You know, I'm, I'm a big, I love international cuisine, so uh, a lot of the stuff when I was down in Florida, the chef was Peruvian, and his entire menu was Peruvian uh, Caribbean food, and we did a lot of beers based off of his menu, based off of ingredients that he could get. Uh, we did a beer called Chalapa, which used uh, ahi char pita, Peruvian peppers, which I can't get anymore. I actually, well, I, somebody just sent me seeds for him, but I can't grow anything, so we'll see how that goes. But a lot of those ingredients came from Peru, and that's how we brewed our beer. Uh, typically, I'll even walk down the aisles of the grocery store and just say, oh, that'd be cool, that'd be nice, and just start picking stuff out and throwing it together, and that's kind of where it comes from. I mean, the recipes are usually written just a day before, if not the day of. We go. <laughs> Which isn't always great, but sometimes it works out. Do you do any bottling? So we do some bottling. Um, in fact, next week we're actually doing a beer release of all of, well, of, of three different variants of a bottled, um, bottled beer, but the only bottled stuff that we do is very limited quantities, you know, you're talking anywhere from 100 to 200, 250 bottles at a time, because we do them all by hand. Everything is hand bottled, hand capped, wax sealed, and we do all of that ourselves between two, sometimes three people. Uh, but the canning line that we have coming will allow us to get our beers out there uh, to a larger audience and be able to actually put beers into distributors if we want, and you can grab six packs and cases to go. Yes. Is it any truth to the rumor that you're going to do a, a Rotary Club brew? <laughs> uh, <Jeez>. Possibly. <laughs> I mean, membership's what, 1,200 a year? So. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yes. Any plans to expand your food selections at, at the? Uh, That's actually a really good question because I have a meeting about that next Wednesday. So currently, I don't know how many of you have been there. I do see some familiar faces out here, um, but our kitchen is very limited by size. The building that we have was very limited. The layout was very limited. Uh, so we do have a kitchen. We do offer food, but it's in about 140 square feet. Uh, the kitchen at your house is probably bigger. That being said. We are currently in talks to actually expand the kitchen, double the size, get rid of our little couch area there in the, uh, in the general seating area, and add fryers, add a grill top, and expand the kitchen out to actually offer, not, not to say that our food isn't real food, but something more than sandwiches, soups, and salads. Um, so that is, that is on the docket for us, and that will be a big project that we're going to uh, hopefully start here in the next couple of weeks. Um, if we do go through with it, I, I plan to have it finished in the next two or three months. So we will offer, you know, full-on burgers, good sandwiches, good actual sit-down meals as opposed to just the nachos and paninis that we do right now. Yes, sir? What effect does aging have on beer? So it's actually very simple. The question was, what does what effect does aging have on beer? Um, similar to wine or distilled spirits. Uh, it's, it's very similar. Uh, with the oak barrels uh, or with any aging vessels, you get some microoxidation, which allows for different flavors to be created on a chemical level that you would get like for wine. Um, it allows the tannins from the oak to be leached into the product, give you a drier mouthfeel, um, but it can also actually add a degree of re-fermentation depending on what sort of microbes or bacteria or yeast would be added to the barrels 
once they're filled. So it can, and well, it, it allows us to fill vessels that are a lot cheaper than stainless steel too. But uh, a lot of it is actually pulling out the characteristics of the oak, of the wood, and of the previous beverage that was in the barrel. So for instance, the beer that we're releasing next week, which is called Betrayal, is a 12% imperial stout, uh, one of which we aged in a uh, Buffalo Trace bourbon barrel. So that take, took on the characteristics of the Buffalo Trace uh, bourbon as well as the oak characteristics. But we also <laughs> got a 10-year-old Cruzan rum barrel and we have aged the beer in that barrel as well. So that takes on the characteristics of the rum, and because that wood is different than the wood, the actual variety of wood is different than the wood from the bourbon barrel, you get different characteristics of the wood and the tannins that are leached out of that, depending on the beer. Uh, so it, it creates quite a, quite a big flavor profile difference from one to the other, and, and mellows out the beer in, in most cases, uh, depending on the style and depending on how long you age it for. How long do you age typically? It all depends on the beer. So we've had beers in, uh, the question was how long does it age typically. Some beers we've had in wood for six weeks. Uh, when we get 30 gallon barrels, the leaching effects from the smaller barrels are a lot quicker than what you would have with a larger barrel. Uh, so we did a rye whiskey barrel uh, that only took about five or six weeks. But some of the barrels, such as our Many Moons, a uh, beer that we do call Many Moons, uh, that has been sitting in the barrel since the, well, since about two weeks before we even opened the brewery. So that's been in there for about 22 months now. And some beers will take anywhere from four or five years. Some beers can take anywhere from five to six weeks. All depends on the style and what you want the, uh, what, you, what you would like the final outcome to be. Yes, sir? Can you list the IBU of each beer on your chalkboard? I can, if you like me to, yeah. We do. We keep it on the menu, so that way we don't have to put it on the chalkboard. So if you look at our actual paper menu, it's got the IBUs of all the different beers. We just don't have enough room. That's the downside. Trust me, I'd like to have a 10,000 square foot tasting room, but you know, 1,800 will have to do for now. Is that all we got? One more? Well, if the reaching from the No. So typically when we have, when we do any oak aging for any barrels, uh, unless they are going to be used as a second use barrel or third use barrel for a non oaked beer. So ba basically what, what would happen is for this beer that we just pulled out of the bourbon barrel, that bourbon barrel is now a neutral bourbon barrel, meaning that the next time that we age a beer in it, the, the characteristics from the bourbon is going to be so minimal that you can't use it to impart any sort of bourbon or wood flavor into the beer for a second beer in that same barrel. However, what we can do is use that, that cask for the other properties that would um, change the flavor profile of a beer. So if we were doing a sour beer or a wild fermented beer, we could use that for a consistent micro-oxidation as opposed to stainless steel because wood is porous and that would allow the Brettanomyces or Lactobacillus or any of the other bacteria or yeast strains in that cask to then alter and change under the presence of oxygen where you wouldn't see that in a stainless steel aging vessel. So it does create properties or allow, allow different properties to be created in that beer that you wouldn't necessarily get from stainless, but as far as the flavors that it imparts, typically you're not going to see any of that wood flavor or those tannins or that bourbon flavor in the second beer unless the barrel was still heavily penetrated with those flavors. If you're having something that you will only age for five or six weeks, you know that there's going to be more of that bourbon flavor still left over for the next beer. So it's a case-to-case -case basis. All right, all right. Quick question. Okay. What's your go-to beer for you? My go-to beer? Yeah. <laughs> Corona? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's any good Pilsner. I'm a big Pilsner guy. I love, I love white Pilsners. That's where I'm at. Thank you, Thank you so much.